Steve Beattie, how are you? I'm good, mate. How are you doing now? Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely great. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm totally fascinated with the power of social media, right? And how, if social media is used correctly, how it brings people together, right? So I find it fascinating that the reason that we're here on the electronic waves being connected is because I, I got into a bit of a funny spot with you on, the, on, the, on a LinkedIn post about building our own bikes as kids. I, that's right. <laughs> and I, 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 I just love that. It just took me back to the, 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 the summers in the late 70s, early 80s. When I, I, mean, I mean, I think it's different for kids now. But I remember when we were kids, first thing we did when we got something new was tear it apart. <laughs> right. It's funny, right? Because uh, I remember uh, I remember my mate getting a bike. And uh, I, I think if I remember correctly, I was five. And I remember getting hold of uh, Spanners. I think it was his dad's Spanners. And we took the bike apart in, in his back garden. And like, <laughs> this is back in the day where you couldn't just go to Tesco or Amazon and like purchase a cheap bike, you know. Yeah. You know, we took every bolt apart, and I remember his mum going fucking crazy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I remember those days. I oh, think totally. I, uh, I think I stripped apart um, like an old wireless that my grandfather had, <laughs> and uh, I, just, I wanted to see what was inside of it. You know, like yeah. how did this thing? You know, that that curiosity of a young mind is a brilliant thing. God, the eighties, man, it was some good times. Absolutely. Do you know? Do you know what I remember? I I don't have a particularly great relationship with my parents um that's a there's probably another podcast than that but that'll be a dark yeah. one um but i remember one great memory i have is i was born in govan in glasgow right and yeah. you don't see things like this anymore there was an, an area where we lived next to the ben bird football ground where all the men maintained their own cars right nobody could afford to go to garages and stuff like that so on a, on a saturday you could go to this place and there was a guy sitting with a roll-up cigarette with a wee wooden desk. And you paid, I don't know what you paid, but you drove your car into this place and it was filthy, right? But there was little bays with, uh, with um, what do you call the cutouts on the floor? Pits in the I, floor. I, I, and it had a light. And you could bring your own tools and they would take your dirty oil. And, and guys just went there with their cars every Saturday and just worked on their cars. And I went with my dad and he taught me all about, so I'm sitting there four or five year old, just obsessed with, now this is a spark plug, this is how you take it out. These are feeler oh. gauges, this is how you change your oil. This is how, so, so growing up, when I got my first cars, my first, you know, it, it took ages for me to realize that it was acceptable to put your car in for a service because you did your, you did your car service and on a Saturday, that's what you did. You went to Halford, you bought an air filter, you bought yeah. oil, you bought spark plugs and you did your own servicing. And it stuck. You know, it, it's funny, like the little, the little things that you learn along your path of your life, little nuances. So, um, like I used to change out my own spark plugs and clean them out, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a thing that I didn't know until, like you're saying, one of these old guys, I think his name is Jockey, and he was like the designated builder for 5,000 Scotsmen around uh, Grampy. And, you know, oh, I need a spot wheel, go see Jockey, you know. Yep. And it was, every, every job was a tenner, you know. Yep. Oh, it's a tenner, you know, it's about 12 hours. What? Ah, oh, a tenner. <laughs> You know, now, um, yeah, every time you went up to his uh, his house, you'd be in the garage under on the on the on the wheels with a light under somebody's yeah. car, you know? and the conversation half the time took place without seeing his face. <laughs> Just you know? legs. He was, he was taking notes and stuff. You know, he was putting it in a computer. It was all up in his head. Yeah. What a guy he was. But um, I remember speaking to him, and he went, "See, the next time you're you're cleaning your spark plugs, I think I had a Foreman deal when you could." The, the days where you could get into your car. Yes. And, um, he says, uh, ah, he says, um, just got a fag packet. The top of the fag packet is the perfect width for measuring your spark plug, the gap. He says, that's the perfect width. He says, forget all that fancy bits. This is what you want. And he was right. And I think, where does that knowledge come? You know, that, that knowledge. I know. And, um, and I, that made me laugh. You know, you're saying all these things. I've got a million memories kicking in. <laughs> Um, so, so life for you, I mean, for people that know you, they'll know that you've got a strong military background. Uh, was it nine years, nine years in the forces? Yeah, just shy of 10 years, right? Just shy of 10 years. Was that straight from school? Well, I left school at 15. Right. Uh, I knew at eight years old, I was going to be a soldier. I just right. knew in my heart. That's all I ever wanted to do. 
and um, I left school at 15 and I, the day that I could join the, the army, I signed up and it was on my, I was 16 and four months old when I signed up. So I took a, a detour. I went to live with my, my uncle and auntie down in Falkirk because um, I was getting into a bit of trouble around Banff. So they sent me south to Scotland, which didn't help. You know, <laughs> send it, send it to Falkirk. That'll that'll clear his head. Up, you know, that'll clear things right up. You know, <laughs> um, I just went a better caliber of, of trouble. You know? Yeah. Um, so I, I've always been a bit of a street smart kid, street smart kid. And um, do you know what? I had a brilliant time. I think I had six months down there, and it was fantastic. And um, the minute I could join, I was it. I was in. And nothing else mattered. I wasn't going to go to college uni. I wasn't going to do anything like that. So I, I did my, my test in the army and they said, uh, you know, you've got a bit of a head on your shoulders. You can go to the Royal Signals. And I was like, what's that? So they gave me all the paperwork and I went and spoke to my dad and he said, that's my regiment. And I was like, all right, well, this is, this is meant to be. Yeah. And um, you know what? I, I haven't regretted a single day that I ever served. It was fantastic. Outstanding. But... It's fair to say. It's fair to say it wasn't an entirely. Uh, it was wasn't all fun and hijinks for you in your in your time. No, no, no. I mean, uh, you know, there's a, one of the the first lesson they ever taught us in the army was from the padre, and it was day one basic training, and this is when you think they're gonna, you know, like the movies, you know, take you on this big fifty mile walk or run and make you swim till you bleed. You know, that wasn't what happened. It, it was a philosophy lesson, and I never forgot it. And he sat us down in this huge amphitheater, and he was Irish, and he had grey hair, and he wrote on the board, Bellete Preparis. And I was like, why is he writing Latin on the board? And he, and he said, does anyone know what that means? Like a bunch of shaking heads. Everyone's quiet, they're not going to speak up anyway. And he said, this is the only lesson you'll ever need in your career. It says, prepare for war. Oui. I knew then, day one, I was like, we are not at school anymore. No, no, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> we are not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I also knew, I was like, I'm in the right place. I'm, I'm where I need to be. This is who I am. This choice. You know, sometimes you make a, you think you want to do a thing. One of the worst things that can happen to a man sometimes is he achieves his goals. Oh, yeah. And you get it and you're like, oh, this is really not what I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I've done the wrong thing here. And the best thing a man can do in that situation is change his mind and just go, this isn't for me. This is the wrong choice. I'm going to flip one eighty and go the other way. And that's when people go, well, where are you going? What are you doing? Like, I figured out it's not for me. So, um, but I knew it was right. And yeah, I had some times in the army where I was actually bullied quite a bit in, ba in, uh, in basic. I had a corporal who was pretty tough on me. He used to kick me in the head if I didn't hit the target at Barnland Centre. You know, that's serious pressure. Yeah. 16 years old, I was, I was actually called Baby Spice. I was the youngest um, intake. Um, so I got that my whole um, first 18 months in the army. Baby Spice, Baby Spice. Which, to a 16-year-old kid, I was like, I want to be a man. I want to be associated yeah. with being a man. So it was, it was tough. And getting kicked in the head and chucked about, it, you know, it was, I'm not saying that's how it is. I'm just saying I, I had that from an individual. And I also had some fantastic um, teachers and mentors. The guy that was um, SAS, um, Sergeant Tasker, he was fantastic. Um, some really good, and he, it's funny because you think they would be big shouty guys, these SAS guys. He was so quiet, you could barely hear him. You know, he was just so soft. Yeah. You know? And that, that spoke volumes to me. I always remember him as being such a good teacher. But yeah, um, going to war and stuff in the army, you see some tough, tough things, and you can't come home the same. It's just it's impossible. No, no. One of the, one of the things. I mean, I've I've done some pretty scary things in my life, right? But I've never been in a situation that I couldn't say, "Do you know what? Um, sorry, guys, I made a huge mistake here. I'm I'm away home. I could, I could always have done that, right? Um, yeah. I, in in any of the scary situations that I found myself in, I could have said hold on a minute, I've changed my mind, this isn't for me, sorry for wasting your time, I'm out of here. How do you, what am I trying to get to here, how do, how, do you, how do you prepare yourself for the things that you and your colleagues 
have done and have, have done many times previously in history. How do you sit yourself in the, how, how do you prepare yourself mentally when you're on the back of a truck or whatever transport you're in, going to a place where you know it's going to be dangerous, you know there's going to be conflict, and you cannot say, do you know what, guys, I'm sorry, this isn't for me. Yeah. You, it's, um, there's only one way you can. There, there's two answers to this question that I learned the hard way. The first one is you train. You right. train and train and train and train and train again. And there's a saying in the army that repetition is the mother of all skill. And you do something so much that it literally becomes that next. It's, it's the place after muscle memory, you know. So, for example, I'll give you an example to that. When I drive every day, like from here to see my, my parents or to catch up with a friend or to go into town to catch up with a business associate, when I'm driving, I'm not just like, you know, it's like aware as we all are. I'm specifically talking out the route in my head. So when I'm driving, it's a military thing, and I'm going exit on left, 500 meters, roads to clear, three cars to my right approaching 20 miles an hour. Because I was trained to drive like that, I physically cannot do it. And it's almost like it's in the background. But when you're in, when you're in war, you are acutely focused in on this. Um, but you do something so much in the military that it, it does instinctively become just who you are. Um, and uh, you can watch as much videos and training. You can talk to the old guys. That's the best thing you can do. Right. And something I would do as well was uh, I would read books on the, the company uh, on the the country's history. And so when I went to Kosovo, I was reading up on um, you know Serbs and Albanians, Serb Croats, and, and the war. You know all these things that had happened and some terrible histories. You know as all countries do, but. You learn a little bit about the landscape or what you're going into, but I'm telling you now, there is nothing on this planet that prepares you for when you see a kid getting killed. Um, yeah. That 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 um, there's no training, and anyone who says that they can handle it is talking out their arse. Yeah, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of um, I've seen a lot of kind of dark stuff, but I'm also taken home from war and um, there was moments in Iraq that I saw more integrity in the local population than I have in some people in my own town. Wow. You know, like um, one of the, I mean, pure example, there was a guy called Ahmed in Iraq and I got to know him and he was a, he was a little bus driver and after the war, when the peacekeeping started, you know, there's still a lot going on. Um, and it's about winning hearts and minds and all this stuff. But I got to know this guy, and I was on an American complex for a little while, and um, I got to know him. Now, I had a signet ring um, that my mum gave me for my 18th, so I'd had it for five years at the time. And um, I took it off one day. I never used to take it off. I was covered in uh, so much dirt and grease from cleaning out generators. And I took it off to wash my hands, and I forgot to put it back on. And it went missing. Somebody took it. Um, I think it was uh, one of the, you know, Americans or Canadians who was uh, accompanied with us. Best of them, you know, that's what soldiers are like sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I was, I was devastated, you know, it meant a lot to me. So I was giving out, like, um, reward schemes, like $500, $1,000, beer, fags, anything to get this thing. I drew, like, a photo. I drew a, like, a picture of it. I was putting them all over the place. And nothing happened. But Ahmed... I told him the story, and he's like, oh, my friend, no Iraqi take, no Iraqi. And I went, I don't think it was used. But eight weeks go by, right, and I just kind of was like getting to the fact that I was never getting it back. No. My crewman, Robo, walks up to me with a pouch, and he says, I've got something for you, Paul. I was like, what? And I, it was like a little pouch with like zip ties, like little ropey ties. Yeah, yeah. And I opened it up, and out came this ring. And I was like, where the hell did you get this? Now, this is in the middle of a place called Um Kazar in Iraq. Now the port had just been taken from the paras and the marines and we're all going in there. And I'm holding up this ring and I'm like, mate, where did you get this? And he's like, I'm never going to believe it, mate. Ahmed noticed it downtown in Basra and bought it with his own money, sorry, in Umkazar, and bought it with his own money and wanted to gift it to you because he didn't want you going home thinking Iraqis of oh. these. Now, I, I, just... I, I actually, I had a bit of a moment out there with him because I, I got to know him over about two months 
and um, I went with them. I had like these two cartons of fags and, and, and they don't drink. And so I had like food and money. And he's like, I don't want anything. He said, I want you to go home, never, never forgetting that we're good people. And I, I tell that story um, to share about integrity. It doesn't matter what flag you, you fly, what color, race, creed, does not matter. No. I take people as they come. Yeah. You know, and uh, that man taught me about integrity. I thought, if a stranger in another country who we've just been at war with can show me the, the measure of love and just basic human kindness, then I'm going to take that with me. It's a big lesson for me. Um, your time, your time in, in active service, um, I've read your, your stuff and I can recommend anybody, we'll, we'll come on to Unspoken Wounds in a wee second, um, but on your Facebook page where you've got that pinned post where you describe you, describe what it's all about, you said that um, once you'd come out of the army, or I can't remember if it was while well, you were in the army or when you came out, but you, you, you suffered from a bit of pressure and, and it didn't go too well, you were, you were quite unwell. When you, when yeah. you was that when you was that when you came home? Um, yeah, I mean there, there were there were telltale signs while I was still in, and um, but back then nobody was talking. Honestly, like, this was like two thousand three to two thousand five. The words mental health were not used. They just they, I didn't even know what they were, you know. And um, I I hadn't even heard the word entrepreneur until I left the army. I'd never heard right. that word, right. you know. Um, but yeah, there was serious. Uh, ramifications after I, I came home from my second tour of Iraq. And by the time I got out of the army, it was in full swing. Full swing. I was I diagnosed with anxiety disorder, adjustment disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression. Um, I attempted uh, suicide three times and failed. Um, I was in a big mess and I was using alcohol because um, that was my go-to. Um, that was my thing. That was the culture of, well, one, it doesn't matter who you are, but the, in the army and being Scottish and coming from the northeast of Scotland, you know, that was guaranteed to be my choice. And um, I was drinking heavily. And I, I really wanted to get rid of them, uh, the, the feelings, experiences, and a lot of the imagery that, I'd, that, that I had that I took with me. Yeah. Um, I just couldn't escape it. And it just crumbled me. And um, I, piled, I piled weight on. Um, when I left the army, I went up to 18.7 stone, right. uh, um, which was big for me. And I just, life just fell apart. And uh, I found myself um, in a prison cell in Durham. And I woke up after a very, a very <laughs> busy night, completely um, shamed of myself. Yep. And I had, I had literally, I had a moment there and I was like, nobody is coming to save you, mate. You're on your own here. Yeah. You cannot blame the world. And it was, it's, it was what um, I think is recognized as the birth of responsibility, where the boy certainly is gone and the, and the man is there and he's like, choose your life in this moment. Yep. And I quit, I quit drinking for 10 years um, that day. I never, I never went back to it. And I decided I was going to live a life of, some type of significance and meaning um, and, and create some direction in my life. Fantastic, fantastic. So you must have had some help with that. That wasn't just, you know, flick a switch and I don't have these, I don't have anxiety yeah. and, and post-traumatic oh, yeah. and all that. You must have had help, right? Yeah, well, this, this is why um, uh, my, my organization is called Unspoken Wounds because back then nobody was talking about them. I had these wounds and I, I was crying a lot and I was breaking down a lot. But it wasn't like, oh, I feel sorry for me. It was like, I, I can't take away the fact that we left a family at the side of the road and we just drove off because it was military um, jurisdiction. I was like, these are wounds that are like affecting my everyday life. Sure. And um, it was very complicated. And I didn't know who to speak to about it. So I thought, well, I actually, when I made the choice to, in that, that day, that moment, the choice was easy. Living that choice was fucking hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hard. The words you know. were the easy part, right? The plan, oh, the plan right. was the easy this, bit. This is it. Decision's been made. I'm going to go and do this thing. Next day comes, you're like, oh, I really, really want a whiskey. I really, really want a, a nip of beer here. I, I want something to take this edge off. And it's like, 
you've made a choice. You know, and that's the truth. I don't care what anyone says. It's not like, oh, I made a choice. You read it in his books and you see these people online and they go, and just this one day I changed my mind. You're like, you're talking shit. <laughs> talking absolute dog shit because it's like, I mean, I've worked offshore for 12 years as well. I'm like, you can go to the rig and you go, right, right. Last trip wasn't great. It wasn't, wasn't exactly what I wanted. This trip, I, I'm going to have the best trip ever. I'm going to get on with everybody. It's going to run smooth. Nothing's going to go wrong. I'm going to go... No, it just doesn't work like that. Yep. Real life has got a very comical way of putting you in your place. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the choice, the decision was made. And for anyone watching, um, the root of the word decision is Latin and, and, and amongst homicide and suicide. When you decide something, it means to cut off from. It means that you have severed yourself. And so when people decide that they're going to quit drinking or they decide that they are going to be less negative, um, and the simplest way to see how much willpower you've got is when you wake up tomorrow, don't complain about anything for one day. It's cool, cool, hard. Cool challenge. Cool challenge. And I'm talking about like, like if you if you nipped your finger in the drawer, you know, the task is to go. Oh, I'm so lucky that happened because I'm alive. <laughs> you know, instead of you know, when yeah. some or the kids do something, you know, or or your lover or your wife does something, you know, whatever. And, oh, I'm so grateful that you're complaining at me this morning. You know, it's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. But um, yeah, that that decision was made, and then I had to do the work, and that meant losing weight. Um, at, the, at the time, to give you some context, I had no car, no job, debt, no money, no savings, no phone, no mobile, um, no, no access to internet. I got made, um, what's it called again, when you get uh, evicted on Christmas right. Eve. I got Brilliant. evicted on Christmas Eve, 2007. And that kind of pushed me forward. I actually remember sitting at the kitchen table Christmas Eve with that piece of paper and I just remember this overwhelming, like burning desire to go, no, no, I don't accept this. I, I need to, and that's when I was, I wasn't desperate, but I become resourceful when I'm pushed. Cause I don't like to fail in the sense of I've accepted the failure. I've been presented with a situation, what are you going to do? And, um, I went to the press and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and put myself out there. I'm going to swallow my pride and I'm going to get some help. So I'll go to the press. I went to the press and within a month and a half, I had a house. Um, I had I'd garnered money. I'd sold some stuff and I got myself money to go and do my offshore survival. Um, I admitted that I had um, a mental health um, condition or whatever it was. And the doctor said, you've got post-traumatic stress disorder. And I was like, no idea what that is. He says, it's called like shell shock. Yeah. I was like, right, okay, I never know what you're talking about or, or Gulf War syndrome and all this stuff. And then I started to, to, to look into things. Now, the guy they said that was going to help me, the psychiatrist, was called Professor David Alexander. But the waiting list was 19 months. And I remember thinking, I'm going to be, I'll be dead before then. I'll never, I will not get through 19 months. That was like forever to me. So I said to myself, I'm going to have to figure this out. Yeah. And I became, I've got this phrase that I say, I say, I gave up drinking booze and I started drinking books. Uh-huh. And I just went to town on anything. I was, you know, I think I read something like 1600 books in, in five years um, or like eight years. And I just, studied philosophy, psychology, autobiographies of people that had overcome like worst odds. And then I just, each book led me to the next uh, mentor or lesson. And some books were rubbish, you know, yeah. and I'm like, oh, just airy fairy rubbish. You know, like, I'll just think about nice things that all work. I'm like, rubbish. <laughs> and then I would, but then I, every now and again, I would get like a real piece of like beautiful human um, overcoming the odds. And one of the most powerful books um, that I ever read was a guy called um, Victor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And he put me in my place in that book. I realized just how small my own um, horrors were in comparison to his. 
um, he was he, he'd served in three um, concentration camps in in Poland. One of them being Auschwitz, and they took his wife, his two kids, his grandparents, and his, and his parents or, or around that effect, and he survived. And everyone else around him lost all meaning for life, as as you can imagine, he would. But inside him, he thought, "I have a decision to make, a choice, because the only thing they can't take away from me is the meaning that I associate to this experience." And he developed this thing called logotherapy. Right. Like logo is the Greek word for meaning. Mm-hmm. So he created the most um, refined psychiatric um, approach to overcoming any of life's challenges. And that is literally hell on earth, hell on earth in that mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. I thought, if this I can do that, I'm going to do it here. You know, and then I started looking around life a lot differently. Because when you don't drink, you lose your social circle. Yes. People stop, they just stop being in touch because they don't associate you with going for a pint or a barbecue or anything. I had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to to really learn. So I started uh, writing again. I used to write poetry when I was in the army. So I started writing again and I I wrote a couple of books on these experiences and then somebody asked me to share my story. And it was a non-profit organization and I shared it and they're like, you just like raised us like 150 grand. I was like, oh, okay. Can you come back and do it again? I was like, okay. So when I stood up to speak, it was the first time since I left that I found a calling. I, like I found my calling. I remember standing up there and thinking, this is me. Yeah. You know, and I'd had, I think I'd had three and a half years of being out the army and I was miserable. I just didn't know what I was doing. I'd know. I tried a variety of different jobs. Each one of them were worse than the next. And just, I was, un- I was so unhappy. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's been a few experiences. I'm, I'm, I look back with fondness, even at all the heart, you know. So, so right now, with Unspoken Wounds, you are, you're raising money, right? This is, this is what you do. You, you encourage people to check in with Unspoken Words, find out all about what's really going on, and you're trying to educate people, you're trying to throw away stigma, open everything up, talk about things and try and help people ultimately, right? Um, is, it, is it all uh, veterans that you help with your, with, with your fundraising and all of that, or is it other things? Well, when I, yeah, when I first uh, opened um, Unspoken Wounds, it was called Unspoken Wounds of the Armed Forces when, right. when it first came out. And um, I'd say for the first four or five years, it was predominantly um, veterans. And it was all over the media, and I got tons of media exposure, and it was great, and it maybe enabled me to get a bigger reach, a wider audience. Yep. And it was it was a big learning curve, but behind the scenes, behind all the, the, the glitz of, of working with STV or a company, and they're like, we're going to spend this much money on a televised campaign, and like that reaches millions of people, and you're like, oh, this is great. But behind the scenes, um, there's, there's a reality of things. And um, they would put us up in big fancy hotels, and I'm like, "Why are you put me up in the McDonald in Edinburgh?" I'd get, I'd get upset, and I'm like, "Can you not just put me in like a hostel?" And they're like, "Oh, we can't do that." And I was like, "No, you can." I says, "Because this money should be going to a veteran." But they couldn't see my approach. I'm like, "But it's all about how it looks." I meant, "No, to us, it's not." You know, and I was, and, mm. and it kind of annoyed me a little bit. But I always did the best I could, and always helped. And each year we raise more money. And um, I, I believe that you can go and do the small thing like hold a tin and collect money. And I, I've done that and I love everyone that does that and we need more people like that. But me being me, I, I have to follow my own gut instinct. I thought, I just want to go right to the top. So when I got the chance to work with the biggest non-profits in the country, I did. And you know, they would spend like hundreds of thousands on televised campaigns to reach millions of people, which would garner donations. Like the first year we did it, um, I broke the record from 1.7 and I got 2.1 million donations that year using, wow. the, power of, using the power of story. Yeah. Um, and I was learning at the same time how real media works, like how social media works in campaigns. And I just became like a, I just became involved, you know. Um, and unspoken wounds, it's um, it's always been free. 
Yep. Um, it's been it's been live now. I've been doing this work for over 12, 13 years, but it's been live on, on online for 10 years now for free. I've I've spent a fortune running that to help thousands and thousands of people. Um, like to give you an example, 2018, 19, we reached something on the region of about five, five million people, which is no small number for a wee boy for Banff. I know. <laughs> That's brilliant. And, uh, you know, like, um, like the video that you were speaking of, um, I, I started to recognise that you were, to answer your question, it, it was veterans to begin with, but there were, as mental health got more, um, it got more space in the, in, in the media world and it became a thing where the rates of suicide in, in teenagers and dads and like uh, men became a big thing for a while. Um, the rates in men at suicide. I realised I need to open this up to everyone. You know, it was, I, I was going to bed at night and I'm like, there's so many people that need this information. So I just, well, I, I changed the, the name of the brand to just Unspoken Wounds. And it fits and, perfectly. Yeah, and do you know what? <laughs> I've got the shock of my life. I think we went from, um, up my, my page reach, I think the numbers back then was something like 4,000 likes on the page. Yeah. Uh, within a couple of years, I was at 16,000 followers and growing. Yeah, that's right. I'm looking at it right now. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely insane. Absolutely brilliant. So, and, so uh, is, is the Facebook page how people can find out about Unspoken Wounds and get in touch with you? Is it, is it all through Facebook? Um, yeah, I mean, just now you can just type in on Google Unspoken Wounds or, you know, you can type in CB or, or facebook.com forward slash Unspoken Wounds and there's something like two and a half thousand videos on there just now. So there's like, there's tons of content and um, there's links to other people's stuff and associations. And I've never been one where I'm like, just come and look at me. I'm like, there's like people come to me all the time. I'm like, yeah, I share as much knowledge as possible. Um, you know, mental health, it's like, mental health is just a word. Yeah. You know, I mean, like people talk about the, this idea called them, um, they say about mindfulness and then they're like, no, that, we don't like that. Let's talk it, let's call it well-being. I'm like, why do you always have to remarket everything? I know. It's like people forget, people forget it wasn't called um, climate change to begin with. It was called global warming. I know. You know and, and the marketers got together and like, yeah, this is a bit dangerous sounding that. Why don't we call it something nice? Climate change, that sounds better. And you're like, can we just call a spade a spade? I know. I, know, I was mm-hmm. watching. I was watching my wife last night. Uh, the uh, I love the old uh, political comedian George Carlin, and he does this bit. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely brilliant. You can find it on YouTube where he talks about how how it's, it's exactly what you said. It's about putting all the mealy mouth words around things. He said we started off. People had shell shock that came back from war, and that oh, was about them. Bad. He said it's almost like shell shock. It's like it's like a, it sounds it sounds like like artillery, right? But we didn't like yeah. that because so. Uh, then after World War II, we came back and they had battle fatigue. And then after another world, the Vietnam War, they had some sort of like syndrome. And then suddenly they've got, they've got post-traumatic stress disorder. So they've got a disorder. You've got something wrong with you and how things, how things have become depersonalized over time and just mealy mouth. You know, the guy's got shell shock. <laughs> you know, deal I, with it. Yeah, it's insane because um, like in, in World War I, they used to call it malingering. And they would, they would, <laughs> shoot, they would shoot you. They would shoot you for it. You know, as we're talking like the British Army, he's got malingering, yeah. bam. You know, he's yeah. useless, bam. You're like, fucking oh, armor. But I, I, I wrote a book on this. Um, I'm a true believer in you're presented with situations in your life that are going to test you. They're going to push your resolve. And sometimes you break. And there's a, there's a belief in like movies and stuff that if you put a real soldier in a situation, he will not break. Everyone has got a, a, a moment with a break. Yes. You're a human being. You're not an AI robot. You're going to break. Um, and there are so many things, you know, if you study uh, how these things are overcome, and it's always with the same concept, human kindness. Yeah. This is how the Americans and the British got through um, being Japanese prisoners of war. Um, you know, they used to come together and say like because like one of the soldiers would break and give a piece of information and yep. feel like he destroyed the, the country or something 
and there was captains and generals that would bring them in and be like, no, mate, we're going to take care of you. You haven't done anything wrong. Yeah. And it was the opposite of what you would think. It was just a good heart, you know, because it's like you've been put through torture. You're going to break. Yes. So when we come home from war, we put ourselves through torture. Yeah. You know, and that's the worst kind because everything about you then, we do it anyway. You wake up in the morning and you go, so your hair's getting a bit thin there, you know, I'm like, oh, I've got my hat on because I'm like, my, my hair's a big mess just now and I'm like, better put a hat on because I'm going live to the world. <laughs> but we, 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 you know, and it's truth, you know, and like, we do these things about ourselves all the time. But when you've got um, shell shock, you know, malingering, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's all the same thing. What you've got, they asked me this once in an interview and I said, they asked me what, the, what it feels like and I said, it's like having a broken heart that never goes away. Yeah, and there was like a bit of silence, and they were like, "Okay, we can all understand that, you know, because yeah. like, we all yeah. know what that feels like." But I remember having a, an experience where everything had happened, all the horrors, all the war, all the friends that had committed suicide, all the stuff that I'd been through, all the all the shame that I was carrying. Because that's the word that people don't like to talk about a lot of. It's it's the shame, you know. Um, they're not scared to talk about it. They're ashamed to talk about it because they're worried about what the world might present or think about them. I remember feeling, I was sat at my kitchen table and I was still working on myself, still going through it, and I'd done a lot of speaking and I'd done stuff for the charities, and all this cool stuff, right? And I'd go home, I was obsessed with gleaning as much from it as I could. And I realised that if I hadn't had post-traumatic stress, if I hadn't gone through all that stuff, the anxiety, the depression, the, the, the darkness, or as the void, as I used to call it, if I hadn't gone through all that, I wouldn't have accessed this capacity within me at the level I have. And I, I started to talk about this thing called heart and fire. And that, that it's all over my own Spoken Wounds brand. Um, I've had fans making me T-shirts. I've got, I've got branded clothing coming out. Um, I'm about to launch a new company to, to share this ethos. But I realized that human heart is the single most powerful resource that we have got, bar none. The mind, the mind, everyone talks about the mind. It is not the most powerful thing that we have. It's not. Because if you can get behind something with passion and integrity and meaning and just that, you know that bit where you go, fuck, I'm going to go and do this. No, that's not mindset, that's heart. And I realized, I called it the gift. PTSD, when anyone asks me now, I say it was a gift. I was, it didn't happen to me, it was given to me. And I had the, I had the stupidity, I suppose you could call it, to handle it to a degree that I realized there was something in here. Yeah. And it was that um, Auschwitz moment, like that, 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 uh, that moment where that person, the worst things had happened to him, and he just had that, maybe there's something in here. Yeah. Maybe there's a thing in here that I could, I could extract from it. I don't know what yet, and it took me about seven years to kind of fully extract, as, like literally to the point where I was like, I think I've got as much out of this as I can take. And I, Unspoken Wounds is that experience. Yeah. Unspoken Wounds is me speaking about the unspoken things yeah. and I've done videos where I'm just walking down the street I've interviewed people in the street I did an, in, I did an interview on uh, Union Street that went viral in within an hour and it reached like a hundred thousand people in a day um, I've done crazy stuff and you know I don't think it's crazy but my, my mates my mates are like you're not wired right mate <laughs> <laughs> no. but um Talking about talking about not being not being wired right. You 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 were telling me just before I hit record there. You were telling me that your next project is uh, is quite extreme, uh, but it sounds like a hell of a lot of fun. What you what? Tell us what you're going to be doing next. Well, I um I've been talking about. It's funny that you were just saying that. I've been talking about heart and fire for for over a decade now, um, and it started with my son. Believe it or not, you know. Um, there's a, there's a part of my new book that I'm, I'm writing, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that for the book. But my son gave me, like, um, he gave me myself back. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I remember looking at him the, the minute he was born. I was like, I'm not going to fail you. Yeah. I'm not going to fail you. I could live with potentially making things a mockery myself, but I will not fail you. And, um, you know, I became a very, very um, focused family man. And um, so Heart and Fire is, um, it's my, I suppose you could call it my code, my ethics, my everything. And that goes for not just when things are going right, it goes for when things are going really bad, when I've made very stupid business decisions. And I'm like, you know what? I need that £400 course. I need it right now. And, you know, like my ex-wife at the time, but she'd be like, why is there 400 quid out of the bank? I'm like, uh, now I've got to explain myself, you know. And it's about integrity and candor and all this stuff. So, um, Bethan's heart became sort of like a story I would tell people. I'm like, you know, the heart of a veteran, you know, it just, it will not stop. It will not stop. Like, you can get a veteran. He is one second away from about to commit suicide, okay? You could, if you caught him in that second and went, I need your backup right now, he'd be like, where are we going? Yeah. You know, he might return to do the, un the unspeakable act, right? Yeah. But he would be there for you. He would selflessly lay down his own agenda for the goodness of someone else. Now that veteran's heart is in all of us. It is in all of us. So the last six months, as we all know, yeah. um, never in the history of humankind has a uh, civilization lived through something as crazy as this. We've had world wars. We've had economic crashes, we've had globalization happening. But this pandemic is bigger than people know. Um, we just witnessed the, the single biggest market crash in history. And nobody's talking about it. I know. And it's insane. <laughs> it is insane. There is the, the, the COVID pandemic. There is production costs. There's companies going out of businesses. There's families falling apart. I haven't seen my son in months. Mm. It's been so hard, so, so hard. And I've spent a lot of time alone. So I've been doing a lot of soul searching and a lot of practical, um, I talk about positivity, but I'm not like, a, let's be positive. I'm a, I talk about being the practicality of positivity. You know? And um, I've decided, I'm like, what do I want to do next? Because offshore's finished for us now, for me anyway. Yeah. And that's 12 years in, and I could fight to get back, but I don't want to be the, the third thousand guy going for the one job. You know, I don't want to put myself under that extreme pressure again. So all the 10, 13 years of unspoken wounds and all the speaking all over the UK, all the non-profit, the, the, the communications, all this stuff has been brewing up and brewing up for years. So I've decided I'm going to cycle. Um, I'm calling it a pilgrimage. Um, I haven't actually explained to anyone yet. I'm not stopping in London. Um, <laughs> I'm going to Kosovo. Um, so I'm going to be traveling the, U the UK for the first. Um, I'm going to create a documentary called Veterans Heart. And I'm going to cycle um, the NC500 first. Yep. And then I'm going to visit um, most major cities in the UK. Um, I'm going to bump into some towns. And I'm going to speak to, like this, like podcast style, in person. I'm going to speak to hundreds and hundreds of veterans along the way and their families and get their story. Because um, the world has heard my story enough. So this isn't about me. This is me doing something I want to do in the selfless way that I can so that the, the essence of it. I, I talk about getting at the essence of shit. I'm talking about the marrow in your fucking bones. You know, like, what's, where's the real story? Not the one that we want to put on the news that meets the, an agenda. I want to hear from a wife whose husband has committed suicide that year. I want to hear how she's coping with the world. How's her son doing or her daughter? You know, what's really going on? Yep. And I want to capture that um, with their permission, of course. You know, yes. I've got loads of people wanting to come on. And I want to create a documentary that ignites change. I want to inspire people. I want to share stories and not just hear the sound of my own voice on Unspoken Wounds on Facebook. I want to, I want to put a, 
a spotlight that's so big on people that it is the noisiest thing people have heard in, in decades. Because I'm watching the world right now falling apart. Yeah. And I want to put some kind of light into that. Yeah. That's what heart and fire is. That's what Britain's heart is. So um, it's going to take a couple of months, I think, cycling my, you know, bony arse cheeks to the brim <laughs> and um, just meeting people and recording it and doing some speeches along the way and, you know, having some fun. I think it's outstanding. And uh, I wish you all the best with it, as many people watching this will. Um, listen, I, I set out to do these in 20 minutes, half an hour. We've run way over time, but I don't care. And You're picking I also, the wrong guy for a 20 minute I have, picked, I have picked the wrong guy. But you know what? I don't care. I was kind of lost in the words myself there. I was getting kind of drawn in. Um, I don't think this is the last time we're going to talk to you. And with permission, we'll maybe come back and check in with you and see how you're getting on with the, with the, with the cycle and stuff like that. But it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you, man. Uh, you too. Really has. It's, it's funny just to let people know like, like how good people are. You know when you get your intentions right and you sent something out and it's fucking real. Not how much money can I make in it. I'm not thinking about the ROI. I'm thinking about, you know, people. So within 24 hours of this thing going live on Twitter, um, somebody sent me a bike. No. Somebody sent me their, somebody sent me their tuning bike. Some guy, he's like, oh, I've got a bike. He sent me a photo. It's, I put it on LinkedIn today. Didn't, don't know the guy. He's like, I'll courier it up to you. And I was like, Mate. It's just people overwhelming. Yeah. It's overwhelming. I've had a lot of the companies getting in touch. I've got businesses wanting to jump on this. I'm like, this is... So it's like when you follow your heart, yep. I think good things happen. And we'll end it there. Thank you so much for joining us, Steve. And we will catch up with you for sure. All right, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, mate. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.